So um, I will try to present some on ongoing work we are doing on developing NLP resources, uh, focusing more on the clinical and biomedical domain, particularly more on hospital uh, data. And I'm trying to also point out some initiatives we're doing in, in the direction of generating multilingual resources, uh, not only for English or for Spanish, but also for other languages. Um, before starting, how do you doesn't move? No, I want, wanted to uh, introduce also my team just in case I'm running out of time. So Jan is here and in the audience, he already presented some work we were doing on, on uh, developing a database on biomaterials. Um, uh, the other members of my team are not here today, but I wanted to stress or to highlight also that we do have domain experts, clinicians uh, in our research group and clinicians which do also work in the hospital. And I think it's really key to uh, engage the end users and the domain experts during the development of these resources from the very beginning, from even the definition of use cases, not only for data annotation purposes. Um, so I'm working in the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is the Spanish infrastructure for supercomputing. And it also offers uh, infrastructure for other European research projects to be to be hosted at Barcelona. So the outline of my talk is um, basically some introduction and background why we're working on on NLP and clinical NLP, particularly also for for Spanish. Uh, some of the idea of or the let's say the, the strategies in uh, engaging the clinicians or the end users during the, um, the annotation process and the development of these resources. And as Fabi already uh, said previously, we were doing quite some work on organizing shared tasks and community evaluation efforts. And I will also show you some of the, the work we did in this direction, in particular for um, data in, in the domain of clinical and in Spanish. And then some of the strategies or adaptation we are doing for this, of, of these resources for our European projects with the aim on generating multilingual and clinical NLP tools. Um, so basically, uh, for, we've got an introduction. I don't need to provide some stress on the importance of uh, extracting information for unstructured data, electronic health records. There are estimates that 80% of clinical available information is unstructured, also including obviously images, not only textual data. And it's a scenario where data is accumulating rapidly. So if you just take one single region in Spain, which is Galicia, which has around, I think, 3 million people, they're producing uh, every day more than 200,000 uh, clinical nodes. So there's a real need to actually be able to process and to extract key clinical information from these, these data sources beyond just clinical coding or structuring data. Um, also, I think it's important to, especially when you had like the previous talk, you know, from Larry on the large language models. Um, it's not only uh, literature, it's not only clinical records, but there are also many other data sources which are being consumed by uh, some of these large language models, which are important to uh, accommodate when doing uh, data processing to generate a more comprehensive view of the pa patient health. So it's literature, the clinical records, clinical trials, the web, social media, uh, patient forums, patents, and so on. And I think it's important to actually address also the issue on integrating and accommodating different uh, content sources when doing clinical NLP or biomedical NLP. And also uh, to go beyond a single language scenario. So many people are working only on data in English. But the um, closer you go into clinical NLP or clinical data, the more important it gets to actually go into um, the issue of dealing with non-English uh, content. So we are working mainly with uh, content in Spanish in our group, uh, why we think it's very important and why we actually were trying to engage people from like the global research community for personal cleaning NLP. There are like 20 countries um, natively speaking Spanish. There are many countries where they have a second language uh, usage of Spanish. So for instance, in the US, there's an estimation that, uh, that there are 42 million native Spanish speakers. So I think it's important actually to go beyond English. And many of you in mean, your native language might not be English. So it's important that you have actually also aware about being able to consume and um, generate 
resources beyond what's going uh, on in the clinical and uh, clinical and peer field in, in in English. And also, when we have like the large language models, I think it's important to uh, take into account the language dimension and how good these models are actually performing, not only for the English benchmark scenarios, but also for for other languages. Um, uh, we all know, or those which are working in clinical NLP, it's a very difficult uh, topic and task because the language characteristics of clinical health records are quite, let's say, distinct from common general English. And I think also when you apply large language models or pretrained language models, this is uh, an aspect you need to take into account. There is a proliferation of synonyms, polysemy, there are many uh, neo, uh, lo, neologisms being introduced. So if there's some time constraint when building these resources, you need to take uh, into account how robust these models are working with newly introduced terminologies and concepts. Think about COVID. I mean, this is a prototypical example. Uh, clinical uh, data and uh, clinical uh, records, at least in the case of Spanish, and I, I would say also for many other languages, are characterized by, let's, sort, uh, let's say, a sort of telegraphic a language with lots of abbreviations, acronyms, and, and some sort of shortened forms of the original um, expressions. There are many localisms and lexical uh, language variants, depending on the region. And think again, when you have like the large language model session later on, think about how these models are working with these characteristics. And obviously, it's a very noisy kind of uh, data. So there are many grammatical, typographical style Accentuation, accentuation uh, spelling errors, punctuation errors, and many sentences are very ungrammatical without verbs. And I think it's, this is an aspect also to take in uh, and which should be taken into account when using NLP uh, tools for clinical NLP and also when accommodating large language models, pretend language models to the, um, let's say, the problems of processing clinical records. Um, and I think one aspect which should be stressed quite a lot as well are the intrinsic very high variability in terms of the uh, specialities in, in the clinical field and the document types. So if you're processing ophthalmology clinical records, they're highly abbreviated. They're very difficult to understand for non-specialists. If you go into psychiatry or cardiology, these are much more narrative type of records. So I think that's that's something you have to take into account as well, that you need to adapt or, let's say, fine tune uh, these models also for very specific uh, uh, clinical specialities and subfield or disciplines. So um, at least from our perspective, there's no general out of the box NLP solution, which would work fine for all kinds of clinical records and all kinds of specialities or even different types of hospitals you usually all, always need to have some sort of adaptation or fine tuning towards the speciality, the particular clinical site or the kind of clinical uh, problem you want to solve. Um, so most of the work we are doing in our group, in, in, at least initially, was financed by a large strategic plan for promoting language technologies, technologies for Spanish, which was called Plan TL. There's some continuation of this plan uh, ongoing now. And initially, there were like four main pillars of our research. One was like developing high quality annotated data resources, corpora basically, labeled data, with the clinician, the domain experts in the loop. Now, this is going into a more multilingual dimension, not focusing only in Spanish, but also other languages. And I will show you more in this perspective later on. Obviously, there's also some interest in generating synthetic data. And I think. Uh, large language models and pretend language models should be very useful for generating synthetic data. We all know about privacy issues and the difficulty in obtaining a data. So for data augmentation or for generating synthetic data, this might be an option for future research lines as well. Um, we were working also a lot in generating, um, let's say open source uh, code and resources for clinical NLP, mainly in Spanish in our case, and also integration of these resources into some platforms. We are working quite a lot now with Cogstack. Uh, I will show you some example later on. And uh, one mechanism which is extremely efficient beyond a single research group or a research team to promote um, the development of, of resources beyond your own group is through shared tasks. So uh, we are liberating and sharing quite a lot of our data sets and resources through the organization of shared tasks 
and benchmarks scenarios to make this effort more reproducible, to be able to compare our results to other teams, and also to generate a more like community-based effort in generating resources, which is particularly important for languages like Spanish, where in the beginning there were very few resources, and now I think we are at least in a scenario that what, what some tools people are going to uh, are using already at the clinical uh, sites. And uh, the legal scenario on sharing and accessing data, obviously an important thing to take into account. And obviously here's the generation of synthetic data might be one option or some federated learning approaches, but obviously, I mean, to have more efficient tools for data anonymization, the identification is also key. Um, I think one recent, let's say, uh, let's aspect on the development of this, um, let's say bio, biomedical or clinical NLP uh, research communities and efforts is also to uh, stress a little more the need of having access to computational infrastructures. I think this was not the case like three years ago. So people were not that, that aware, or at least not that much worried about having access to computational faci faci facilities. And I think this is something which changed quite a lot in the last three years. And basically, uh, this has to do with the need to train and generate these large language models and pretend language models. And I, I think this is something which might become up also in the, in the late, in the next uh, discussion session. And one aspect we are focusing quite a lot on is in the generation and, and release of uh, annotation protocols and annotation guidelines. So I think it's not enough to generate high quality manual annotated uh, resources. You need to have some sort of very robust annotation processes and guidelines which are documented and released and which could serve um, you know, beyond your own research needs to boost or to foster the adaptation of these annotation protocols by other teams or other research communities. Um, I'm not going into details, so there are quite a lot of pre-trained language models, large language models being developed, monolingual, multilingual, domain specific. And I think it, this is why I think there's a big hype in, 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 in clinical NLP to actually be able to make use of these resources. And uh, these uh, pre-trained language models, domain adapted language models are having high impact in the community. They're highly downloaded and reused and they're used for different purposes benchmarked from different uh, pre-trained language models and large language models um, based on uh, on the usage of or, or, or adaptation to particular tasks or, or for the development for, for certain uh, components. Um, at BC, there are also uh, some ongoing efforts in generating um, uh, language models adapted to the clinical and biomedical field. In, in the case of Spanish, um, there's an effort on building uh, models uh, called the Maria effort, and we're releasing this, these models also to the community, and they're being used for, for by multiple teams for mainly for entity recognition tasks. Um, so um, one um, way of working in our group is to actually engage the end users, the clinicians, the domain experts from the very beginning. Uh, in the development of these annotated resources and also in the use or adaptation to particular use cases. Um, so here, I think there are like four pillars which need to be taken into account from the very beginning. One is like this variation or, or let's say high degree of heterogeneous um, data and content sources being uh, processed in the clinical setting, depending on the hospital, depending on the speciality depending on the clinical record type, if it's a discharge summary, if it's a clinical course and so on. Uh, private uh, privacy issues, how to access the data, how to de-identify the data, or how to process the data at the clinical site without needing to share the, the original data collection and to align it with uh, certain end user needs from the very beginning. So how are you going to use and explore the results? Is it for uh, generating features for predictive modeling? Is it for structuring large scale in the clinical uh, data at the clinical site, generating a knowledge graph? What is the clinical use case of the of, of um, uh, associated to these uh, components in the very you know in the, in the very beginning? And um, I think we already talked about the needs of interoperability, how you standardize and normalize these results. And I think this is um, an aspect which have not been researched as much. So how you map and normalize, how do entity linking of these very complex medical concepts to control vocabularies, to ontologies. In the biomedical field, people are working a lot on that, on gene normalization, 
mapping to gene ontology, but in the clinical NLP field, I think there's more need to um, foster or uh, benchmark these resources, in particular, if you look at resources which are not in English. So there are many open questions there. How good are these control vocabularies actually uh, for normalizing and standardizing gluten? Um, so already um, told you a little more on the aspect related to the problem definition in data selection. So just selecting the appropriate data, the clinical site is very difficult. You only have very, let's say, limited metadata, clinical codes associated to the, the clinical records. So actually data selection and alignment of um, use cases to the data selection uh, is, is not so easy uh, if you work in the clinical NLP field. Um, but I would say that um, if you generalize the, the needs on uh, applying clinical NLP solution at the clinical side, what we saw are that um, two very typical scenarios. One is the clinical side um, predefines a list of variables or clinical features, and the clinical NLP tool should extract exhaustively uh, all the all the records or the clinical data associated to these predefined clinical uh, variables or features. I think this is one prototypical um, use case scenario. The second one is more like large scale structuring of the clinical records. So you basically want to normalize and map the entire collection of the uh, electronic records to a predefined collection of uh, control vocabularies, for instance, Nomad City or ICD-10 codes. Um, I already told you about this annotation protocol. So I think it's very important I will stress uh, the need of sharing these annotation uh, protocols and guidelines with the community, and um, also to have efforts to translate or adapt these annotation protocols to different languages. So we we're working a lot on generating annotation guidelines for English and also for Spanish. And I think it's key to actually to go beyond the language, a uh, particular language, but generate multilingual annotation uh, guidelines and resources. Um, we are generate quite a lot of guidelines for Spanish, and we are now in the process to translate these guidelines uh, to, to other languages, starting with English, but we also, in the context of European projects, will translate it to, to six other languages to be able to actually share these annotation protocols and annotation strategies uh, for data beyond, beyond Spanish. What do I mean by these annotation guidelines? It took us quite some time to generate these annotated resources. So each of these guidelines is structured into certain sections on general annotation rules, positive rules, what you have to label, negative rules, what, what you should not label, some linguistic uh, characteristics of the uh, textual uh, data you are annotating, and also some um, guidelines or strategies to normalize or harmonize, to do some entity linking of these um, mentions to control vocabularies with example, uh, with example, uh, particular examples, a definition, and some unique identifier for each of these rules. So I think the protocol we are following, following uh, is, is quite robust and can be actually also used as a starting point for generating guidelines in other languages. And we are translating our annotation guidelines now to English, to Italian, Dutch, Swedish, Romanian, and Czech. Um, this is a very time-consuming uh, process, this annotation uh, guideline development, the annotation and generation of gold standard annotated resources. And uh, we're actually using these uh, annotated resources to generate, a, let's say, initial seed model to automatically annotate later on clinical records with this, uh, these uh, initial models. And uh, obviously, I mentioned already the importance for data integration and normalization of these, these results. So we, we generate a baseline model, usually using public data. So we use a lot um, what we call, um, what is called um, clinical case reports. So these are publications, which are very close to discharge summaries in terms of the kind of content they are, they're providing. And these annotated data sets from, uh, from uh, clinical case reports are being used uh, by us and also by other research teams to generate the base model. And then this base model is, basically deployed and adapted at the clinical site and using a sort of iterative uh, refinement retraining of the original model um, to process the, the clinical data at the clinical site without having any problem with the privacy issues. Um, this is done with the clinician and also often with the help of linguists. 
and basically if you have an initial data collection, you run your base model on it, you generate, uh, let's say, pre-annotations, and the clinician following these guidelines has to have to correct these initial results, and then basically they're fed back to the to the model and, and it's it's being retrained. Um, so that's more or less the strategies we are following. So for instance, we did some experiment at one of the collaborating hospitals, the Hospital Clinique of Barcelona. So we had a base model trained on this public uh, clinical case reports, and they had to do the cor a correction of 200 uh, clinical records, pre-annotated, and then we retrained the model and annotated a, a second, uh, in a second iteration, the clinical data set, and you could see that there's a dramatic increase in, in recalls, particular, but also precision uh, of the results you got compared to the initial first uh, group model. So I think it's a strategy which is quite, let's say, efficient in adapting the original model to the clinical site and to the, uh, to the clinical data, at, in this case of the hospital clinic. And we did that for different, uh, let's say, clinical concept recognition uh, systems. There's one for diseases. So the original model had like in for the, for using this discharge summaries, 64,000 uh, mentions recognized. And the retrain model had uh, 73,000 mentions recognized. You could see there's an uh, improvement, even if you have a small collection of manually corrected uh, records. In the in the case of the original model, and the same is true also for for other entities. We we did it also for symptoms, and uh, for yeah for symptoms for medications for species, uh, for uh, clinical procedures. Just to, to mention, going not going into details. When you do this processing, you have to take into account that many of these mentions are negated. So not only uh, training and adapting the clinical NLP model is important, but also to retrain and adapt. For instance. Uh, negation or speculation uh, extraction of these of these systems. And obviously then there are many applications. Once you recognize these entities, you can look at variation and in terms of frequency of particular mentions over time. This is our results we had for for COVID and different waves. So basically checking not checking out which how the what's the fluctuation of these entities over time and particular entities, how they actually changing also over time when you look at the clinical records. In this case, we were checking out some things more related to the, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, data sets. Um, not going into details, but we also did this uh, adaptation and fine tuning of these models for, for instance, for negation and, and the same as for the clinical entities, just correcting a few, uh, a couple of hundred of uh, clinical records can improve the precision recall of these uh, more linguistic kind of uh, data extraction systems as well. So what do you have or what do you get after all this process? So from unstructured clinical text, this is in Spanish. Uh, so if you don't understand, I apologize, but basically what we are able to generate is semantically annotated uh, clinical uh, records with all these mentions labeled and also the normalization, harmonization of these, uh, these entity mentions with also some uh, annotation quality of the original data uh, in terms of internotate agreement, but also benchmarking the quality of the clinical NLP components in terms of precision, recall, and F-score. So now for Spanish, we do have over uh, 45 semantic entity classes already uh, extracted and annotated, which covers more clinical characteristics such as diseases and symptoms and procedures, but also more like the more social demographic characteristics such as the profession of the patient, uh, aspects related to locations so where he traveled or where he come from, uh, and, and also more linguistic characteristics such as negation, speculation, or even temporal expressions also we have already uh, annotated and extracted for, for content in Spanish. And in the end, obviously you can use that for structuring data, basically generating some sort of um, more like harmonized results and of the mentions and of the normalization, for instance, those numbered CT IDs. Uh, or you can use it for browsing or exploring the data, generating some knowledge graph from, from the clinical records and trying to understand a little more at the, at the large scale uh, global result, how these particular ent entities are occurring in, in your data collection. 
and generate basically some sort of knowledge graph or more like a, let's say a graphical output of the of the clinical uh, content. So um, I'm not sure what I'm doing with time. Basically, one of the um, I think very key aspects of our research group was to go beyond our own like collaboration with hospitals but also to um, share the annotated resources with the community and use these annotated resources in a more, let's say, a benchmarking or shared task environment, basically sharing annotated data and, and using it as a base for community evaluation effort and uh, driving the development of tools and components also by other research groups. So we, um, I think most of you know how shared tasks work. And I don't need to go into many details, but basically there's a very long period on pre preparation uh, of training data and annotation. And then there's a short uh, period where uh, you release, let's say the uh, training data, which is usually a couple of months, uh, but it's a short period if you compare to the uh, original, uh, let's say construction of the annotated uh, corpus. And then there's some so, sort of very short test uh, uh, case scenarios where we release the test data and people have like one week or sometimes two weeks to generate their predictions. You benchmark all the different teams uh, on a com common uh, benchmark data set. Um, this is a very old slide, but there have been competitions go going on for English for quite long, uh, a long time from question answering uh, information extraction, retrieval, summarization, machine translation, so on. But there are also quite a lot of shared tasks beyond English. So we have been uh, organizing these shared tasks for, for Spanish now for right around like six, seven years, I would say. Um, we had uh, competitions on uh, detection of um, tumor morphology mentions and normalizing them to ICTO codes in a task called Cante Mist. And uh, we'll show some examples later on of these different shared tasks. One more on clinical coding in Spanish, basically uh, coding clinical case reports to um, ICD-10 uh, codes for procedures and for diagnosis. We had also one competition for Spanish for medical in semantic indexing. So indexing abstracts to mesh terms, basically, in this case for, for Spanish and uh, a competition also on uh, automatic anonymization of case reports, a synthetic data set of, uh, uh, of uh, clinical case reports. Um, there were also competitions on more like uh, socio-demographic characteristics, such as professions and occupations, uh, basically, which includes also some sort of activities of, of, of the of the uh, patient, and if they're ret retired or if they're um, uh, actively working or not. Uh, we had uh, one uh, competition also on machine translation of medical uh, records, uh, of medical abstracts, uh, Spanish to English, and also the translation of terminologies, medical vocabularies, uh, one on locations and uh, places, basically, and for species uh, and, uh, and pathogens. So to show a little more something more intuitive related to these tasks. So for instance, in the living near track, we uh, generated a gold standard data collections annotated with species mentions in Spanish. And all these species were manually normalized to uh, uh, NCBI taxonomy codes. So um, we tried to enrich this data set also for particular practical use cases more related to pets and, and animals. So if for some uh, clinical scenarios, it's important to know whether you live with a pet, for instance, uh, animal injuries, uh, food, and also common infections, all kinds of infections, uh, infectious agents. And uh, it also included the annotation of all types of humans, uh, which is important for family history. And we uh, also generated a multilingual silver standard corpus using machine translation technologies. So basically we have like a collection of, of these gold standard data collections related into English and uh, to Romance languages, which, is, which, which includes also uh, Italian, French, and another uh, Latin original languages. Um, so how did teams perform or how good are the systems which are trained on these, these systems? So for instance, for the 
species recognition, the uh, precision recall and F score was quite high. So it's, it seems to be a sort of quite straightforward task for these, these systems with an F score of around 95.1 and on the top, top scoring uh, team. And, and all these results are very similar, or very close already to human internal hit agreement results. So um, another task we're working on on the detection of places. So as many of you have traveled here to, to Tokyo, so you might uh, think that it could be also important to know where you've been, where you've traveled, where you come from, and not only like geographical locations, which you can uh, pinpoint to a map, but we also included a uh, sort of uh, location information, which is sometimes important for clinicians. So like inside the hospital or what is the facility inside the hospital where you're actually um, moving or where, where, where you have been. And um, we also did normalization of these entities to geo names, to plus Google plus codes and to SOMED CT identifiers. So particularly for more clinical facilities, this is, Sometimes you cannot normalize to a particular geographic um, coordinate. So we also had one task on this. And uh, I think it's important actually to think about how, how these resources could be um, adapted to other languages as well. So the original data set you can see on one side is in Spanish and we generated with machine translation, also silver standard uh, data collection, for instance, in this case to English. And all these mentions are then normalized or, or mapped to what I told you already, the, uh, plus codes, geo names, or also nomad city identifiers, depending on the type of, of entity dimension. Um, I told you about the oncology data set on clinical coding of tumor morphology. So all these mentions are manually annotated and manually linked and mapped to, to called to vocabulary, so coding systems. And um, in case of the Cantamis, we didn't really generate so far silver standard data set, but it's something we, we could explore how to do as well. And also the results are very competitive and very close to human annotation quality. And for data anonymization, we also have a data set in Spanish, which will detail guidelines uh, on all the types of sensitive and personal information, which needs to be, let's basically uh, annotated and uh, detected and, and, and um, hidden from plain sight. And we actually use this uh, an uh, anonymization system to uh, de-identify and anonymize real clinical records, in this case of our collaborator of the hospital clinic. So we anonymized the data set that did uh, correction of the, let's say the leaking entity dimensions. We trained, we trained the model and we could generate through this process uh, an anonymized data set, which has been released at Fusionet. So, you know, mimic uh, the mimic data set. So it's basically the same place. And uh, this is now uh, being, um, released and accessed by the community for research purposes. So the common one uh, corpus, as we call that, the Spanish name. <laughs> um, so we uh, be able to share this uh, clinical uh, data set also with the community. Um, you see, I'm, I'm stressing that we have quite a lot of different shared tasks, but I think it's important to actually see how this could be adapted to other languages or other uh, particular um, domains. So we had one effort on uh, uh, annotation of disease mentions called this the mist also organized in the context of shared task uh, another one on uh, clinical procedures and i have to say that even for english there was not that much uh, out there in terms of resources uh, inter uh, annotated with uh, mention of clinical procedures they were complex types of entities with, which require deep clinical uh, understanding we also generated a competition called medpognair the data set has been released and we also generated multilingual resource for the Medpognair data set. And Pharmaconair, which is basically the oldest one, I presented it here in, at BLA quite some years ago. And this is more related to drugs and chemical compounds, including also genes and genes, proteins and vaccines. And this data set has been normalized also to, to as nomad CT identifiers. So all these mentions are manually labeled and they're manually normalized to control vocabularies with annotation consistency analysis. And the same is true for, for this the mist. And um, we also share all our resources with the community. Uh, so the original corpus, the guidelines, the silver standard uh, annotations, 
was translated to, to different languages. We usually try also to release a gazetteer or vocabularies, which might be important for, for normalization and for, for some of these tasks. And in some cases, we also even uh, try to record the uh, talks of participating systems and teams and release them through, um, through YouTube playlists so people can actually see what has been done in the past and, uh, and interact with the original uh, uh, developers later on. So in case of the Distemist, we already have a silver standard for seven languages, which is basically uh, English and the Romance languages, including French, Portuguese, and Italian. And in the second phase, we, we are going to release also a silver standard for Dutch, Swedish, and Czech. And in the third phase for German, Danish, and Norwegian. Um, and what do we mean with this silver standard? So we have the original data set with the manual mentions, and then we use machine translation and a strategy which we call annotation transfer. We'll, maybe if, if time, I can show you some more detail on that, uh, where we try to map the original mention to the translated mention. In, in, in this case, you can see it for English. Um, so the, the very last uh, task we organized in BioCreative was called Synthemist, and it was the first task in BioCreative non using data which is not in English, in this case Spanish, uh, on Synterms. So Synterms is also a type of entity which even in English hasn't been uh, addressed that much. The same as for clinical procedures because they were difficult to annotate. Consistency is very difficult also for human annotations, for, for human annotators and, and clinicians. And also the, let's say the, normalization uh, resources or control vocabularies are not as complete as for other type of entities. So even the manual annotation is manual entity linkings were complex for, for, for symptoms. So we had one task on mention recognition, one on uh, entity linking to normal CT codes, and we had some exploratory tasks using these machine translation data sets for doing or boosting, or at least promoting some, some efforts beyond Spanish. Um, I don't need to tell you why it's important to annotate and extract signs and symptoms from um, from clinical records. Basically, the motivation has to do with all kinds of things related to predictive modeling, differential diagnosis, for understanding better rare diseases, and so on. Um, we had this annotated, manually annotated data set of 1,000 case reports, annotated by a team of clinicians with all these mentions manually uh, um, labeled and annotated with consistency analysis associated to it. And the subset of this was also, well, you can see the guidelines and some example of these mentions. Um, we also did the manual um, entity linking and mapping, but not of the entire data set. It was too time consuming. And we didn't have enough time for, for the, uh, to use it for the shared tasks. We will release the normalization of the remaining subset, which you couldn't do for the for the share task in in a couple of of of, of weeks. And uh, manual number entity linking was done in this case to some CT codes. Um, this is an example of this corpus with uh, with a, like, let's say an example case in in uh, with the labels of of BRAT. So some of them are quite straightforward, short symptoms, but they're also very long descriptive symptoms, which are very difficult to extract. Um, which actually uh, can match or can be can be mapped to multiple SNOMED CT codes. So even for uh, human experts to do their manual annotation was really very complex. And um, I, I think the annotation consistency was quite good, taking into account this complexity. So we had also, as, as for the others, the original gold standard in Spanish, which generated silver standard in multiple languages. And we are translating the guidelines also to be able to uh, correct and uh, annotate new resources also for other languages beyond Spanish. And I'm not going into details on the participation. So the teams, uh, the top scoring team at an FCO of uh, 74, uh, um, which is, if you look at the original internal data agreement uh, consistency, quite good result, I would say. Um, so I'm not going into the technical details. So all of them used. Uh, transformer-based uh, architectures and the top scoring team in this case used an, an ensemble of different models to achieve the best the best results. Um, if you look at all these different entity recognition systems, uh, the performance of teams is really very uh, heterogeneous. So some tasks are quite easy. The identification anonymization seems to be very easy. 
detection of uh, species is also quite easy and um, drugs and, and, and chemicals are also straight, quite straightforward if you go into the clinical case reports, but obviously diseases and uh, symptoms um, much more challenging, and there's a more there's more variability in, in terms of the top scoring teams as well. Um, so, what's the impact of this this these shared tasks uh, beyond just an academic effort? So, I think it's important also to generate new resources and systems, and to share and release this uh, through a community effort. So, we were looking at all the different shared tasks we have organized for Spanish. And overall, we did quite a lot of different tasks, I have to say. Um, uh, uh, we had more than 800 uh, systems or runs generated through this effort by 173 teams and uh, by more than 20 countries. So uh, I think it's a global effort, not only by people working in Spanish. And I think many of the teams actually participated because they wanted to adapt these uh, resources to their own language. So we had teams from, for instance, from Italy, from, from Italy or from even from Germany, and they were thinking on how, how they could actually use a similar strategy to adapt their tools for their own languages. Um, so participants were not only from academia, from hospitals, but there were also quite some commercial participation in, in some of our shared tasks as well. Um, so, I think I already pointed out some, um, let's say, uh, effort or strategy on generating multilingual uh, resources through the translation of this gold standard data set. And um, here I think it's important to uh, be aware about um, the difficulty to generate uh, this manually annotated gold standard data set. So there are, there are quite, quite a lot of time on analysis and modeling the, the original problem. Uh, you need to train these professional annotators. And if you have worked with uh, uh, clinicians and uh, healthcare professionals, as opposed to biologists, it's very difficult to get them to understand the task. They don't have much time. So if you have to engage them in these projects, you can usually not hire them full time. You need to rely on a couple of hours a week. So this uh, is very challenging. Uh, and it's very um, cost demanding. So um, to annotate, annotate by a clinician in terms of cost is not the same as a biology PhD student. I don't want to downgrade anyone, but it, it's not so easy. And, and they usually are not that much interested in, in these kind of problems as well, I have to say. And to generate these um, annotation guidelines and validate them takes a very long time. So this is a long-term pr uh, project, I would say. So we were thinking on, um, especially in the context of some of the projects we are working on, in, like for the European projects, how to um, boost or how to make it more efficient to adapt this strategy to other languages without starting from scratch, as we did for Spanish, and, and obtaining more efficiently these annotated resources and, and corpora, and also to be more, let's say, more robust or more efficient in um, training them how to do these annotations in, in practice beyond the, one, the ones we are doing for Spanish so far. So uh, we're, what we're doing in the context of some of these European projects is, I told you already we have public data, this clinical case report, which we have manually annotated, takes quite some time to generate the base model with this manually annotated data set. And then what we do is inside the clinical site, inside the hospital, we uh, basically do this iterative refinement cycle. So we have a, it's all a platform with this base model, we pre-annotate the data set in, inside the clinical setting, and then the clinician just need to correct the, the output of these models. And for the multilingual part, we'll, we'll see this is even more easier. Um, you'll see later on in an example case. So uh, how do you do that in terms of the infrastructure itself? So in lucky enough, in uh, two of these European projects, we have teams which already are working with a platform called Cogstack. They're using this platform inside the clinical side already. And it has quite some, uh, let's say, technical inf in infrastructure for data ingestion, pre-processing, uh, and also for doing some pre-annotations with an annotation service that uh, it's in integrates called MedCut. And it also allows you to explore and visualize some of these results. So what we do is basically retrain this annotation service uh, iteratively at the clinical site. Um, so in practice, we're doing this uh, currently for uh, these different European languages for Spanish, for English, 
uh, for Dutch, uh, Romanian, Czech, Swedish, and Italian. So some of them are quite challenging for us. For instance, Czech is something totally out, uh, outside our original aim, but it will be, you know, uh, we're pushing the boundary of what we can do with facilitation uh, transfer through machine translation technology somehow. So what we do, what we are focusing on is some process to have a more intelligent document uh, selection. So how you select the clinical records in the very first place as they're highly redundant and it's difficult to actually select uh, informative training instances. Then there's a second part which has to do with the translation annotation transfer process to actually translate it, as I told you, from Spanish to the other languages and then uh, some interface or some strategy to do this manual validation uh, of their dramatically uh, suggested annotations. Um, so I think I only have three minutes left. Is it correct? So I will try to rush a little more. <laughs> so for the document selection strategy, we were looking at text similarity approaches and clustering of these uh, documents. Also to compare our, let's say, synthetic or, or public data set to the uh, clinical records inside the hospital and also inside the clinical data. Those which have been working on uh, with clinical records, you know, there's a high degree of cut and base and internal redundancy. So you want to actually, for the model building, to uh, select more informative records in the very beginning. For the uh, automatic annotation transfer, uh, basically what we use is uh, we have the original text in Spanish, which generated a translated version into the target language. And then we use a sort of, oops, well, how I managed to do that. So um, basically through the like three things, one is funding. So for the, one is funding. So for the original corpora, we, we did have quite some funding from this strategic plan. And uh, for the uh, adaptation data languages, there are uh, like three projects, which are funding basically these translation activities, but it took some time. So uh, to generate uh, the annotated data sets like the disease uh, corpus, it took uh, three years to generate this manually annotated data set. So it, it's not, not something you can do in a couple of months. And then there are some, some uh, resources we could actually get through um, subcontracts, but uh, you cannot just subcontract these things and forget about it. It took quite some human power to do the quality control and develop the guidelines. So um, work with it in English. And there, there are specialized companies, for instance, work with, which you can hire to do the annotation process. But for Spanish, you need to teach them. So it's not something you can just you know rely on the company because they don't know how to do that. Um, so basically for the, um, now I have even fewer times. So basically we use some machine translation and a sort of rule-based approach to match the original mentions to the translated ones. And um, obviously there are issues with machine translation. So we don't want to have, our aim is not to have a perfect parallel corpus with everything exactly you know, annotated in the same way. This is unfeasible. Also machine translation systems uh, that suffer from hallucination and uh, domain specific uh, characteristics of the clinical language is also an issue. But I have to say machine translation technology is advancing quite uh, rapidly. And it, it works uh, amazingly well, I have to say, even for language pairs where you would not expect that. So like for, we have, we, have that, we have the advantage that Spanish is quite, is working quite well in machine translation, obviously not as well as English, but quite well also for directionalities like Spanish to Dutch, Spanish to Swedish. So it, it works pretty well. And we, we don't need to have a per perfect silver standard. You need to have a silver standard, which is, which is good enough to train a base model. So that's that's our aim, actually, to start from something we don't need to do the annotation from scratch in the in the other language. This is unfeasible. And uh, there are problems with abbreviations. There are problems with hallucinations. There are some problems with that the translated mention doesn't fulfill or fit the annotation criteria originally posed for Spanish because the, the way they write it is sort of somehow different. But still, it's good enough to have a, a label data set for for doing the manual cor uh, correction by the clinicians, in, in, in this case for Dutch, and training a base model for Dutch if you don't have anything else. Um, so I have one minute. So basically these things, as you mentioned, they require funding. We have we had some funding from this strategic plan. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure whether we will get some funding in the future from this but strategic plan. There's money, but it's very political now. So you don't know exactly how to distribute that part. 
but we have also uh, funding through nat other national projects and European projects. So there, this multilingual data set is mainly fu funded by a project called Data2 for Heart, where we have the aim to generate a multilingual gold standard corpus for different languages. So I showed you already English, Dutch, uh, Italian, and Swedish, Czech, and Romanian, and with collaborations from clinical sites. So each language has a clinical hospital, which will provide this correction and annotation process. Um, then there's another one uh, uh, called um, AI for heart failure. In this case, we'll focus more on social demographic characteristics, such as the lifestyle, professions, and locations. And there are not that many languages, so there are a little fewer ones. But we have also partners outside Europe, one in, from Tanzania with data in English, and one from Peru, also in Spanish. And one from rare diseases, where we have data in Spanish and Catalan. Uh, focusing on, on three rare diseases in rheumatology and normalization to human phenotype ontology. And I have to say, if you work with data from Catalan hospitals, the data is mixed in Spanish and in Catalan. They have everything you know, mixed together. So you work in a real multilingual environment. If you want or not, you have to deal with this, this issue as well. And um, I think Jan already told you about BiomatiB. So there we also want to have something not only for English, but for Spanish as well. And uh, while well, I think I will just conclude here that um, it's important to take into account, uh, uh, well, I think the order of my, my needs and conclusion is not the correct ones, as I have to figure out what I wanted to say there. But basically, one thing is to generate this training and manually annotated uh, data set in a more efficient way going beyond a lingual, a single language, see how to actually use machine translation to generate annotated data sets in multiple languages. Uh, also, uh, it's, it's key to have something more uh, going on on testing and improving these annotation transfer methods, how we are ideally mapping these different mentions across multiple languages. And what is very important is how, how these resources are actually being used in real life, so how to, how to transfer these resources into a clinical setting how the clinical site and the hospital is going to use this, and also for like more industrial environment, how to actually being able to, to explore these things for commercial solutions. So I think that's basically it, and thanks a lot.